We've seen a lot of Pro phones over the years. Flagships like the Google Pixel 6 Pro, the iPhone 13 Pro, the Xiaomi Mi 11 Pro. But even budget phones, Redmi Note 10 Pro, Poco X3 Pro, Realme 8 Pro. If I had to guess, I would say 50% of smartphones on the market have a Pro version. But not a single one of them is as Pro as this right here. This is the Sony Xperia Pro I. I being for imaging because they want this to be the best camera ever on a smartphone. It has printed no plastic in packaging, which is usually just a politically correct way of saying no charger. But if we open the box, well, that was tighter than expected. We do have one here. It's a 30 watt reasonably powerful adapter and there's a USB-C cable followed by the phone. Okay. I'll steal the question from your head. It's only been a few years since normal smartphones hit the $1,000 mark. What on earth could this thing possibly do that would justify 1,800? Well, as it turns out, I'm kind of surprised by how much. And just to give you an idea, every single shot in this video that's not from this main camera will be taken on this phone. Specifically, there are five things that this Pro Eye does that put it in a different category, even arguably above the ultra phones of this world. Number five is actually the design. And I'll admit, I started off with rather mixed opinions about the rather obtuse looking camera system, the slight rattle when you tap the bottom and the sheer lack of color on this thing. But the more I've used it, the more impressed I've become at how it's also distinctly function over form. You've got a matte finish on the back, low maintenance, and these ridged rails going all the way around the sides, I wouldn't say they're particularly pretty, but they do make the phone tremendously grippable. And probably as an unintentional consequence, they also allow it to stand up on three of its four sides. This might look like a similar shape to the latest iPhones, which I mean, I straight up said had a poor in-hand feel, but in reality, the combination of this being a much narrower phone with the slight tapering in of the flat sides makes it feel actually quite burdenless for a phone that's apparently packing in market-leading hardware. But then it goes much further. It's got a dedicated shutter button that you can press to access the camera, and then within it, half press to focus and full press to snap, just like on an actual Sony Alpha camera. A side-mounted fingerprint scanner, which is, to be honest, pretty average in terms of speed, but the positioning has meant that I literally haven't thought about needing to unlock this phone. It's very convenient. A completely separate programmable shortcut key to open whatever app your heart desires, a micro SD card slot that, get this, you can take out with just your fingers for SD card swapping on the go, and this is definitely one of the first phones I've used with a built-in hole to attach a lanyard. Oh yeah, and to top the whole thing off, it also has not just an IP68 rating, but also an IP65 rating, which means certified water and dust resistance, yes, but also resistance against low pressure jets of water. You see what I'm saying, right? Crazy expensive phone, yes, but also for an actual pro, this is shockingly well tailored to their needs. So number four then on what makes the pro pro is how it handles media consumption. See, here's the thing with Sony. This company is doing really well in the audio market. They're doing really well in the TV market. They're doing really well in the camera market. Uh, fun fact, every camera that I normally use is a Sony. But their phones, which for the most part have been built by a separate division called Sony Mobile, they just haven't stuck. They've lacked differentiating features. They've had confusing names. They were never bad, but it's just that for most of their history, they've been missing an identity. Some curved inwards, others curved outwards. Some weren't curved at all. It didn't feel like there was a broader strategy. However, they've now changed tact. Pretty recently, Sony has brought their mobile division in. They've integrated it into the wider Sony corporation with the goal of implementing their strengths in these other markets, audio, TV, cameras, into their entire lineup of smartphones. And so even though this phone is literally nicknamed the camera, the focus is actually broader than that. So for example, the audio is tuned by Sony Pictures Entertainment. With dynamic vibrations that automatically add physical impact to anything you watch or listen to. We have a headphone jack that supports not just headphones, but also external microphones. Any video you watch will be run through Sony's X1 engine, which is used to upscale content on their Bravia TVs. Oh yeah, and the actual screen itself is kind of nuts. A 4K HDR OLED 120Hz display. Now, just to make that very clear, 4K 
Which means that while phones like the latest iPhone have about 450 pixels per inch, this has 643. It's pin sharp to a bulletproof extent. It doesn't matter how close you're holding this thing, you won't see pixels. Plus, it's implemented in a way that's not irritating. At the risk of sounding like a Luddite, I'm still of the opinion that 4K is in most cases too many pixels for a 6.5 inch screen. But thankfully it looks like Sony isn't blind to that. So you have both a normal viewing experience and creator mode, which whacks up that resolution and uses professional colors. And it can be made so that this only turns on in the apps for which you can actually tell. The only thing which is still a little controversial is this super tall cinematic aspect ratio. It's made like this so movies, which are traditionally shot really wide, will fill the screen. But while it does leave more room to be blown away, it also leaves more room to be irritated. When you find a movie that fills it, and you've got all these technologies working in the background to fuel this authentic immersive experience, there's nothing else like it. And to be fair, in almost all of the scrolling apps that we use, it's not wasting space. But equally, because these are such extreme proportions, for the more amateur content, which is not made with that in mind, there is no happy middle ground. Also, all these Sony inter-brand tie-ins, they don't necessarily make it the best. Like even though we have dual front-facing speakers with Dolby Atmos and Sony tuning, the iPhone speakers just sound fuller. But for the most part, yeah, I mean, this is a strong, unique media experience quite nicely uplifted by the support of up to a terabyte of external storage, on top of the 512 gigs you already have baked in by default. And if you are enjoying this video, then a sub to the channel would be... <clears throat> Flabbergasting. No, but seriously, uh, hitting 10 million subscribers was like the 2021 goal. And we're like, we're so close. We're literally on the cusp of it. So, I mean, if you do watch my videos regularly, I would really, really appreciate it. Okay, number three is the Pro Eyes approach to photography. On first glance, the camera specs don't look too enchanting. Sony's gone down the Apple route of sticking with a set of three 12 megapixel cameras. However, it's not the resolution that makes this special. It's that this phone camera is using a one inch sensor. You won't find a bigger one on the entire planet. They prefer to call it a 1.0 type sensor because it's not using the entirety of that one inch surface area, but that's pretty standard. And for perspective, the iPhone 13 Pro Max uses a 0.6 inch one. And one inch is actually the same size as the sensor found on Sony's rather high end RX100 V7 camera from a couple of years ago. But in theory, this should be even better because of all the image computation that smartphones do on top of that. Also remember that Sony hasn't just put a sensor in this phone, they're the ones who make these sensors. It's safe to say, I was pretty excited to try this. And you know what? I think they've pulled through. Bearing in mind that this is still pre-production software, this phone takes very pleasant photos. You get the distinct impression that it's not using as thick a layer of processing as most other companies. And that's not always a positive. If it's dark and gloomy outside, your shots are gonna look dark and gloomy. If you're in a poorly lit room, your photos will feel poorly lit. This is not a Google Pixel. This is not gonna turn night into day. This doesn't have the AI to make sure faces are never blurred. This can't magically erase photo bombers from the background of your shots. And if we're going off Sony's past phones, you're probably not gonna get the best portrait mode either. However, there's something really liberating about having that control yourself. Yeah, especially combined with this huge image sensor, you really get the feeling that you're taking pure images and that the sky's the limit, that the ceiling is incredibly high for what you could potentially take. When used right, this is a joy. And even though this ludicrous amount of options, combined with a pretty clunky UI, is borderline anxiety-inducing next to most phones, there's a few things that do make it easier. Like how for starters, we've got 315 autofocus points, or basically zones in which the phone is constantly monitoring to make sure that what you want to be in focus is in focus. Plus eye focus and object tracking focus. Or how all optical elements here use a Zeiss T-Star anti-reflective coating, which when combined with the fact that the main lens is built from high transmittance glass instead of the plastic that most phones use, means that you just have to worry less about strange lens flares from bright light sources. Or how this phone has its own dedicated image processor called Bions X, which although it doesn't mess with the natural colors, you can tell it massively chips away at graininess and enhances clarity. 
The final key differentiator, I guess, from any other current flagship is dual aperture. Or in other words, you have the option here to physically reduce the amount of light that the camera lets in, which will give you less background blur if you want it. I mean, it is just another option, so you can't complain about it, but given that one of the phone's biggest selling points is how much light it can now process, thanks to its big sensor, that more background blur is usually associated with more cinematic quality, and that more light is universally better for image quality, uh, the ability to restrict that light is nothing more than a niche feature for fringe scenarios. But do you know what actually impressed me more than photography? It's how this thing takes video. And to be honest, I wasn't expecting to say that. It feels like we've just fallen into a market where the iPhone is a league ahead in video quality and all Androids are playing catch up. This issue usually becomes because you can't apply all that processing that you use on photos 30 times per second for a video. However, because Sony doesn't seem to rely as heavily on that processing, its video actually looks quite consistent with its photos. I mean, I don't need to show you more video samples we've been shooting on it this entire time, but there's a few things that I will point out. A, we have all the same autofocus and tracking features that we had in photos, also now in video. B, is that you might know that most phones now have just become able to take 4K video at 60 frames per second, right? Well, this can take 4K video at 120 frames per second, which means two things. You can either watch it back at full speed for ridiculously fluid footage, or that's also enough frames to be able to slow the video down four times and still have a smooth output. Let me put this another way. You can take slow-mo in 4K resolution. So for perspective, this is the Sony Xperia Pro i versus the iPhone 13 Pro, which as far as I'm aware has the second nicest looking slow-mo. See, Sony's added in a third microphone. It actually sits right next to this main camera here to improve speech pickup. And I'm not gonna lie, it sounds really good. Although not exactly a unique feature because Apple and Samsung's latest also have something pretty similar. And D, not one, not two, but actually three separate camera applications. So one is Photo Pro, which can take both photos and videos. One is Video Pro, which is focused on being able to record just professional video, but video that's ready for immediate shooting and uploading, say for YouTubers, and then Cinema Pro, which gives you even more options, more color profiles, more aspect ratios, and this shoots 10-bit footage made for post-processing, for people who will want to upload into a proper editing program and do everything from scratch how you would on a cinema cam. Now, to be honest, while it is of course impressive that Sony's created three separate applications just to capture footage, I'm not convinced that the fact that they felt like they needed to is necessarily a good thing. Isn't it a bit like you go to a restaurant, you order a meal, and then the three separate parts of your meal are served on different plates? I can't quite understand why all these features couldn't have just been bundled into one camera app with three different modes, so you could easily flip between them. And on that note, there are two things that I'm not a fan of. The first is that while it is refreshing that Sony's footage looks pure and almost untouched, based on this early look, it does seem to also mean that you lose the luxury of that slightly processed looking, but still nice high dynamic range that you might get on say the iPhone. But also this high end main camera is, is really quite wide. And I think it would have benefited from having more magnification. You probably noticed on a lot of the shots we've taken with it, how things just look a bit distorted. That's because we've had to go right up close to them. And also lenses with more magnification also just naturally have more background blur. But all this takes us to number one, the thing that takes this video beyond any phone I've ever used. This is the vlog monitor. And it's one of the most supremely extra accessories that I've ever seen launched with a smartphone. Check this out. You mount the phone into the Bluetooth handle. There's a magnetic area where the monitor slides in. You connect the monitor to the phone via USB-C and bam, you now have a secondary display to be able to use the front camera to vlog. Now, to get the obvious out of the way, this is like a $200 accessory, which when added to the price of the phone makes it literally a $2,000 package. So it's not fair to compare its results to phones that are half the price, but the results are phenomenal. Like this is footage where both the video and the audio is being captured on the phone. You gotta admit there's like a, there's a certain cinematic quality that's pretty unmatched right now. Worth mentioning though, is that without this gadget, the actual front camera footage is not the best. So 
that brings me on to the big question. I am pretty much the target consumer for the Xperia Pro I. I love cameras, I use Sony gear, making content is literally my job. This is clearly a very advanced phone for a very advanced price. Does it seem worth it? I do need to stress here that this is not a review. The phone I've got here is not final, and I haven't been able to test the zoom camera because it isn't working yet. This is just an opinion based on what I've seen so far. But yeah, you're paying for a pro experience, and I can confirm you are getting a pro experience. For someone who really knows what they're doing, this is a fun, versatile, joyfully unencumbered experience, which can produce results so far not seen on a smartphone. That said, is it in itself a bit of a contradiction? Because won't most of the people that this is being targeted towards already have and would rather use an even better camera? And because for everyone else, average consumers, it is too much. If I think of all the people in my life who aren't camera enthusiasts, I think they'd all end up with better results from a Google Pixel 6, which is far less pro, but smarter, easier to use, and just as fast of a phone. Oh, yeah, and it's like exactly one third of the price. I think Sony is very aware of this though. And if you were to ask me why, like why is Sony putting so much effort into a phone that they know is only gonna sell in the thousands? I actually think the answer is marketing. I think there's a certain kudos to owning technically the best phone money can buy, even if it's not a good value phone in of itself. Sony doesn't have a strong foothold in the smartphone market right now. And so I reckon their entire objective with this is to just sit as a showpiece. To leverage the power of their other pro brands, like Bravia TVs, like Alpha cameras, which enthusiasts already approve of, to make a pinnacle smartphone that's good enough to drive conversation. Conversation from pros, with the hope that pros are gonna be the ones with influence, so the word of mouth that they generate could potentially trickle down into just positive associations for Sony phones in general. And I just wanna cap this off by saying, this Xperia Pro I, while I wouldn't recommend buying it to most people I know, it does make me excited about Sony's future. They seem like pretty much the only brand who's actually trying to make a phone for enthusiasts who also have the resources to be able to follow through and deliver on that. And if Sony can stay ahead on the hardware curve like this, while finding a way to distill the essence of Sony Corporation and all its various technologies into a more streamlined and visually simple interface, I think they have all the ingredients of a hit phone. Okay, here's something to think about for a second. Your location, your operating system, every hardware detail of the device you're on right now, as well as all your past browsing history. These are things that you'd want to keep to yourself, right? Well, this is how much information a website immediately knows about you the second you click on it. And to be honest, if it's a website you trust, then it's fine. But there's probably a fair few that you visit that you wouldn't want to know this. And that's where Surfshark VPN comes in. As far as I've seen, it's the most affordable way to keep yourself anonymous. It's just over $2 a month for as many people and devices as you want, but there's another perk. Because you can effectively pick the location that you want your device to come from, I can, for example, pick the US and watch US TV shows. You can effectively have the exclusives for every single region without leaving your home. Like if I wanna watch Batman The Dark Knight, I just switch to Canada and I can do that. So check the link in the description and use the code BOSS. That'll give you 83% off and an extra three months for free. To find out why the Galaxy S22 Ultra is looking super exciting, click here. Or to understand the precarious situation that Huawei's found themselves in, click here. And my name is Aaron, this is Mr. Who's the Boss, and I'll catch you in the next one. I kinda need a bigger dictionary.